Hey, welcome back to another awesome episode on the Rockorama. You know, it's a beautiful early fall day here in northern New Mexico. There are some spectacular outcrops of Triassic through Jurassic rocks behind me. And in them is a story of a real catastrophe. It happened about 205, maybe 210 million years ago in the late Triassic, where literally thousands of predatory dinosaurs and almost all one species, it's, it's just thousands of one species of predatory dinosaur wound up dead in the same spot. The quarry up in those hills, we're gonna go take a look at and see if we can shed some light onto what might've happened with these things. What killed them? How'd they get preserved? A lot of theories. We're gonna go look at some actual rocks though. And on our way to the quarry, let's talk about 10 interesting, fascinating, and even downright groovy things you might not already know about Coelophysis bowri. Groovy. The first groovy fact that most people don't know is that just like Axl Rose was once Bill Bailey and Darth Vader was once Anakin Skywalker, Coelophysis bowri started its life with a different name completely. You see, when it was first described by Edward Drinker Cope, yes, his middle name really was Drinker, uh, he thought it was a species of a genus called Coelurus, which is known from the Jurassic Mars information in Wyoming. Now he wrote that in 1887, and later that very same year, he decided it was not Coelurus, but in fact, a species of Tanistrophius, which is a small Triassic reptile with a really long neck. Now, two years after that, Cope being a really good scientist, recognized that he had made a mistake and it wasn't Tanistrophius, it was something different. That's when he came up with the name Coelophysis. It literally translates to hollow form, uh, which is a description of its hollow bones and delicate nature. And incidentally, hollow bones are a characteristic of modern birds, and that's just one of the anatomical features that links them to theropod dinosaurs. Unfortunately, the specimens that Cope used to characterize Coelophysis were not terribly complete. So flash forward to the 1990s, and a couple of researchers decided to rename Coelophysis as Rio Arebosaurus based on more complete specimens. This didn't sit too well with the rest of the vertebrate paleontological community, so there was a whole lot of controversy and a couple of new names were proposed, including Longosaurus and Megapnosaurus. Finally, the International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature, yes, there is such a thing, had to step in. And they said, in essence, that Rio Arebosaurus is a ridiculous name. We like Coelophysis, it's well known. We're gonna stick with it. And in fact, they made one of the most complete skeletons from the Whitaker Quarry here at Ghost Ranch, the neotype for Coelophysis bowri. And that's why it's still called that to this day. While we're on the topic of nomenclature, that brings us to groovy fact number two, specifically its species name, Bowri, which is in honor of George Bauer, who was a paleontologist originally from Germany. And at first he wanted to be a forestry specialist, but he got really interested in fossils and geology, came to America, and wound up working for Cope's arch nemesis, Othniel Charles Marsh. That lasted for a few years before he went into academics, and he eventually wound up being the chairman of the Department of Vertebrate Paleontology at the University of Chicago. Cope respected him, liked him a lot, and decided to name Coelophysis in honor of him. Unfortunately, George Bauer died at the young age of 39 in 1898, which is one year after Cope himself passed on. And groovy fact number three is that the original specimens of Coelophysis were not found by Cope himself, but by an amateur that was working for him named David Baldwin. So just like today, amateurs played a huge part in finding the original specimens that then get named by experts. And along those same lines, we can talk about groovy fact number four, which is that the quarry we're walking to was made famous by paleontologist Edwin H. Colbert, but it was actually found by George Whitaker, who was an amateur working on the ranch. And that's why this quarry is called the Whitaker Quarry. I think we're here. Yeah, this is it. The Coelophysis Quarry from 1947, along with the sign and everything you'd want to know about Coelophysis. The quarry is up on that hillside, but it's been a few decades, so it might be hard to find. All right, so the sign has a lot of good information. It tells us about the local geology, tells us a bunch about Coelophysis the dinosaur, and it ends with talking about how hundreds of these animals died and were probably buried in a flash flood. Groovy. Bringing us to groovy fact number five, which is the fact that we don't know exactly how these skeletons got here. Let's take a look at sediment and the stratigraphy and see if we can come up with some scenarios. One scenario that's been published and repeated a fair bit is that 
This was a big flock or herd of animals that was trying to cross a river and flood, and they got caught up and drowned and swept downstream. If that was the case, you'd expect the skeletons to be preserved on a river bar, a fluvial channel deposit, but in fact, they're in a siltstone and mudstone that looks more like an overbank. Also, there's no evidence that these animals were actually living and traveling together at the time of their death, so we've got to really take that one with a grain of salt. And what we're left with now is a situation where a whole bunch of carcasses of predators wind up on a floodplain. And that leads directly into groovy fact number six. Just like we don't know exactly how they accumulated, we're not quite sure what killed all these animals. But we can get some important clues by looking at modern floodplain environments that accumulate in semi-arid environments like the Chinle Formation. Especially during drought, at which time animals are forced to rely on dwindling water and predators really rule the roost here. And there's a couple of mechanisms that attract these types of animals. First is obviously the water. It's a drought situation, these animals need water. Second is food. And as predators, they tend to go wherever there's meat available, whether it's alive or dead. Most predators are not above scavenging. In fact, almost all of them will eat a dead animal. So if there's a carcass next to some water, hey man, you're set. But it's also a perfect breeding ground for botulism and other deadly bacteria. And in fact, waterfowl and birds in particular are really susceptible to this. So we can envision a scenario where a group of psilophysis is attracted to a water hole during a drought. They drink the polluted toxic water, drop dead. Then the smell of their dead bodies in the water attracts yet more psilophysis, who are keeping away the herbivores, while eating their dead friends, or trying to, drinking the water and then dropping dead themselves. And it's kind of a self-perpetuating cycle leading to the thousands and thousands of dead predators of all ages. And based on what I'm seeing on this really short, really quick and dirty look at the outcrop, my money's on that scenario. And since I just mentioned birds and how susceptible they are to toxic death by bacteria and various other pollutants, Let's take a minute and talk about some interesting facts about Psilophysis' anatomy. Especially groovy fact number seven, which is that it's the earliest known dinosaur to have a wishbone or a furcula. Groovy. For centuries, anatomists thought only birds had this bone and that it assisted in flight, but as it turns out, their ancestors, the theropod dinosaurs, had one too. And Psilophysis is the earliest known example of that. But its bird-like anatomy does not stop there. And in fact, that brings us to groovy fact number eight, it had scleral rings most similar to those of modern birds of prey that are active in the daytime. This was demonstrated in the 2004 publication by Reinhardt et al, who were actually studying specimens from this very same quarry. And in case you're wondering, scleral rings are bony plates in the eyes of a whole variety of non-mammalian vertebrates, like fish, lizards, dinosaurs, and of course, birds. All right, we made it this far together. We only have two more groovy facts to go. So let's get the show on the road with the final two. That is number nine. Coelophysis has been considered a cannibal, then it was considered not a cannibal, and now it's considered a cannibal again, possibly. And that's because a specimen found here in the Whitaker Quarry was originally interpreted to have a baby Coelophysis in its rib cage, which was thought to be evidence of cannibalism. As it turns out, closer examination reveals not only is the skeleton not in the rib cage, it's under it, but it doesn't belong to a Coelophysis. It's actually a small crocodilian called Hesperosuchus. But the saga doesn't end there because there's also been things found around the mouth of one of the skeletons that have been interpreted as regurgitates, in other words, fossil puke, that appear to include baby Coelophysis bones. And as with most things in paleontology, that is up for debate, but it should be noted that stress cannibalism is pretty common in modern animals, including amphibians, birds, crocodilians, and especially Komodo dragons. But let's leave on a lighter note than that, which is groovy fact number 10. We honestly don't know how many species of Coelophysis are represented in this quarry. The general consensus today is that there's one species, Coelophysis bowery. But of course we can't observe these things in the wild, so we don't really know if there's one or two species. There definitely seems to be at least two morphs, a very robust one and a more graceful one. And in the modern world, there's a lot of really closely related species that look a lot alike and only genetics can tell them apart. So based only on what we can observe with these specimens and by analog with modern animals, we have to be open to the fact that there might be two or maybe even more species of very closely related Coelophysis, or there might be one highly variable species, Coelophysis bowerii. We just don't know. Groovy. So with that being said, I just wanted to say, hey, thanks for sticking with me on this little hike out to the quarry. I'm going to jump back in my vehicle and go to Utah. As always, I appreciate you watching, and I will see you on the outcrop. Take it easy. I'm going home.